Hello, my name is Joshua Murillo, and I will be your instructor for this course, Astronomy, Descriptive Astronomy. So this is kind of a broad sweep over most areas that we think of as astronomy today. Right off the bat, you might notice that this lecture is covering two chapters. So given that this is a one semester course and there's a lot of material in the book, I'm going to be combining some chapters, we're going to be skipping some chapters, and kind of skimming over some things. As far as testing, I'm just going to be testing you on the material that I present in the lecture. So the book has more stuff that you can read about, very interesting stuff, you're welcome to do that. But when it comes to quizzes and exams, you should be watching these lectures. This is where the pertinent information is going to be. That said, the text that I'll be following is Astronomy, Introduction to Astronomy. It's an OpenStax production. So this is a freely available textbook. You can find it online, download a PDF, or just look at it online. Very nice sort of thing. So this lecture, we're going to look at science sort of broadly in the universe and a bit kind of a just about astronomy broadly, and then also we'll get to talking about orbits and gravity. So just to start out with some nice pictures, you got Mars, you have uh, a picture of the sun, though it's not how the sun normally looks to our naked eye. We'll get into some of uh, the different kinds of pictures we actually have here later. But also here we see what's known as a planetary nebula, particularly the Crab Nebula. There's also a regular nebula, and the Orion Nebula, and a picture of some galaxies. A couple of galaxies actually kind of collide and merging. So these are just the kinds of things that astronomy is interested in. Basically, things that are up there in the heavens, or in the celestial sphere. And we'll be talking more about each of these kinds of things throughout the course. One way of stating what astronomy does is it's just studying celestial objects and phenomena. So we use mathematics, we use physics, chemistry, in order to kind of understand and explain the sorts of things that are happening not on Earth. There's a whole list of the kinds of things that are looked at or are of interest in astronomy. Turns out that astronomy is one of the oldest science, or natural science, as you might call it. You probably know people have been looking up at the heavens and wondering about what the heck's going on up there pretty much since we were conscious of the up there. So one other thing to note then, this being a descriptive course, I'm really going to try to stay away as much as I can from relying on mathematics to tell you about things. There's good and bad to that. Good thing is you don't really need to know mathematics in order to appreciate hopefully the content of this course. The bad thing, mathematics is sort of its own language in a way, and when you're doing any kind of science, you really rely on that language in order to actually describe things more precisely and in more detail. So without math, there's only so much we can get into. Right? So that's why this is like descriptive or like an, or a conceptual sort of course. Very briefly then, what is science? There's a lot of ways you could say this, think about it, understand it in terms of scientific methods and attitudes and ways that people go about science, but one way of thinking about what science is, is a attempt to map or make models of nature or the universe. Very basic way of understanding what science is. And these maps are formulated and refined through careful observation and experimentation. A couple of nice quotes about this sort of stuff. One from Max Planck, who was one of the founders of quantum mechanics. He said, an experiment is a question which science poses to nature, and a measurement is the recording of nature's answer. Something else to keep in mind, which people often forget, is that the maps or the models are never actually nature itself. They're always approximations, and they're ways of describing the things that we see in the phenomenon we encounter. So this quote is just, the map is not the territory. Don't get confused with the fact you're looking at a map of some place. That's not the place, right? But it's a very useful thing in understanding the place. Again, can't really go into too much detail, so I really just kind of have to give you like little bits of like this is the information we're going to need to understand the topics we're going to explore. So one of those bits of information 
is that there is sort of a speed limit in the universe. And that speed is the speed that light travels in a vacuum or through interstellar space. And there are many ways of writing down that speed in different units. Some of the more common ones are in metric units, which is meters per second. The 300 million meters per second. Or you could write that as 3 times 10 to the 8th, or 3 times 8 tens meters per second. That's also 186,000 miles per second. And that gets us to sort of a common and useful unit that comes up a lot in astronomy, which is the light year. Just how far light travels in one year. It turns out that that is about 10 to the 16th meters. Or what is that? 10 quadrillion meters in a year. There are some illustrations here showing the amount of time that it would take for light to get to Earth from these different objects. So from the moon, it takes about 1.3 seconds. From the sun, it takes about 8 minutes. From Mars, about 12, 13 minutes. From Alpha Centauri, our nearest star, that's almost four and a half years. It's a long while. And from the far side of the Milky Way galaxy, over 50,000 years. And that's very, very fast. Right? Light goes very, 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 very fast. The universe, though, real big. So one result of this speed of light, or the fact that light takes time to move from one place to the other, is that the light that we're seeing that reaches Earth, it's always like a past image of the thing we're looking at. Like when you look at the moon, the light you're seeing right then is the light that left the moon about 1.3 seconds before you saw it. When you're looking at the sun, that sunlight you're seeing left the sun about eight minutes before, so what you're seeing is sort of like a past image of the sun. And the light that we see at Alpha Centauri, it's about four and a half years before now, before our now, of Alpha Centauri. So sort of a consequence of the fact that light takes this time to propagate is that when we look out into space, we're also looking back in time. And the further you look out, the longer light is taking to travel, the further back in time you're looking. This is a pretty useful thing in terms of astronomy because it turns out that the universe is some 14 billion years old. And at some point we'll get into cosmology and thinking about the beginning of the universe. And we would really like to be able to measure things in that very early time in the universe. Well, we can if we can actually collect light that came from 13, 14 billion light years away. So some things that we will need in order to at least understand some of this concepts that we're talking about. One I already kind of snuck in there, which is a notation that's known as scientific notation. It's a way of writing really big and really small numbers without having to write a bunch of zeros everywhere. It is also called powers of 10 notation because you're writing a number and then times how many tens there are. So you could write that as times 10 raised to a power. Sometimes you'll also see this is just written as a lowercase or even uppercase e followed by a number. That means the same thing as times 10 to that number. One example, we could write $79.2 billion as 79.2 billion. You could also write as 79.2 followed by eight more zeros. In scientific notation though, if you move the decimal place over 10 places, then we get 7.92, and then we say times 10 to the 10, right? Because that's 10 places we move the decimal over. You can also write it as just E10 there. So both of those say the same thing, 7.9 times 10 to the 10th power. You can also use it to write very small numbers, which we'll see a little bit of that too, right? That would be 10 to a negative power, right? And that's saying how many times you're dividing by 10. Hopefully this is not entirely new to you, but if it is, maybe do a little side mission and watch a video on side of notation. Okay, some other important things are the way that we talk about stuff. And in particular, what I'm talking about there is units, the units we use to describe measurements or the things that we're interested in. So one of those kinds of things are distances. For us, typically when we talk about distances, we're talking, at least in the United States, we talk about feet, we talk about miles, right? Those are all in one unit system. It's unfortunately not a great unit system, a better one is the metric system, which uses meters, kilometers. So shown here are some conversions 
three feet is about a meter or one third of a meter is about a foot. And in this course, we'll mostly talk in terms of meters and kilometers and light years, but I'll probably also bring in feet and miles because you're probably more familiar with those. So another very widely used unit in astronomy is known as the astronomical unit, AU. And that is the average distance the sun is from the Earth, which turns out to be about 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers, or 150 million kilometers. And also shown there is a little bit more precise measurement of the light year, but again, it's about 10 to the 13th kilometers or 10 to the 16th meters. And one other unit that's used sometimes in astronomy or fairly regularly is known as the parsec. It has to do with angles, but practically it's about 3.26 light years. So those are distances. We're also probably be talking about temperatures fairly regularly. And the temperature scale we're usually used to in the United States is Fahrenheit. And in Fahrenheit, water boils at 212 degrees, the water freezes at 32 degrees. There are these other systems, Celsius and Kelvin are both metric units for temperature. In Celsius, boiling happens at 100 and freezing happens at zero. A bit nicer. Kelvin is very similar to the Celsius measurement. It's just sort of shifted away from Celsius or shifted down. So in Kelvin, water boils at and freezes at 273, still 100 degrees difference, just like in Celsius. But Kelvin is really sort of defined by this absolute zero. This is the lowest possible temperature that there could be. And that lowest possible temperature in Kelvin is zero degrees Kelvin. Uh, compare that to some of the other scales, Fahrenheit minus 459 degrees, Celsius minus 237, again, you compare Celsius and Kelvin, they're just kind of shifted uh, apart from each other. So you might be asking yourself, like, what is this lowest possible temperature? Well, temperature, it turns out, is just a measure of the motion of the atoms or the molecules that make up a material. Right? So if I say, what is the temperature in this room? I'm also asking, what's the average sort of motion or velocity, or kinetic energy, Right, of the atoms in this room, right? Of the stuff that makes up the air in this room, the oxygen and the nitrogen. So if you think about temperature as relating to the motion of these atoms and these molecules, well, when you decrease the temperature, that's less and less motion, but eventually you get to the point where the things have just stopped. Everything stops moving, right? All the atoms, there's no movement at all, right? And you can't get less than that. There's no less movement than no movement at all. So once you get to no movement at all, zero absolute zero. Practically speaking, that's not even really achievable because of things like fluctuations, quantum fluctuations. There's always some bit of jiggling movement of matter and particles and such. But at least theoretically, absolute zero, zero motion, molecular, atomic, all that, absolutely zero motion. So something else we're going to need or we're going to kind of use to understand some topics, some ideas in astronomy are relationships, particular kinds of relationships, meaning how some property of a thing is related to another property. So when we talk about relationships or how things are related, the basic relationships we're going to use are proportional and inversely proportional. So a proportional relationship is one where two things are sort of following each other. Right? If one goes up, the other is going up. If one goes down, the other goes down. Right? Those are proportional. Some examples are like, you know, the amount of gasoline you put in your car is proportional to the price you're going to pay for that gasoline. More gasoline in, you're paying more. If you put less gasoline in, you would pay less. Some other ones that are more related to physics and math are like the amount of force you apply to an object, like how much you push an object, is proportional to the acceleration that that object experiences. You need to worry too much about what that means if you're not familiar with those concepts, but this is another example. The last example here is a little bit more difficult to understand maybe because it's, we're talking about things that are proportional, but like one sort of counts more than the other. 
So this last example is the area of a circle is proportional to the square of its radius. Or you could say it's proportional to its radius squared. So meaning that if you increase the radius, then the area, right, the radius is the distance from the center to the edge of the circle. If you increase that radius, the area increases, but it actually increases as the square of the radius. So you increase the radius by a factor of two, the area will have increased by a factor of two squared or four. You increase the radius by a factor of five, the area will have increased by a factor of five squared, 25. So the opposite then of proportional is inversely proportional. This is a relationship where one thing goes up, it means the other has to go down. Or if the first thing goes down, it means the other has to go up. Sort of doing the opposite thing. So one example might be the amount of water left in your cup is inversely proportional to how much you drank. If you drank a lot of water, there's not much left in your cup. Or the size of a piece of paper is inversely proportional to how many times it's folded. Take a piece of paper, fold it once, it's now half as big as it was. Fold it twice, it's half again, it's a quarter as big as it was. Right? So the more times you fold it, the smaller the paper is getting. And another one that's a little bit trickier, but we're going to think about a little bit more later, is the apparent size or how large an object looks is inversely proportional to the square of the distance it is from you. So if I take an object, right, it looks this certain size, if I push it back to twice as far away, it's going to look smaller by a factor of, well, two squared by four. It's going to look a fourth the size. So the last relationships are a little bit trickier to think about, but overall from, from here we just want to be able to at least understand that when I say something is proportional, it means it kind of goes along with, or the two things that we're talking about kind of go along with each other. And inversely proportional means the two things we're talking about are doing the opposite things. One goes up, the other goes down. I think we'll probably be addressing this sort of overall idea more or regularly as the course goes along, but just wanted to say now that something that's difficult but also like really just cool about astronomy is the scale of things that we're talking about. It's hard to imagine how large some of the things are that we're going to be learning about, you're going to be learning about. So one way we can try to think about the scale of things is by comparison, by drawing things to scale, and we'll actually watch a short clip of a movie where we see things kind of zooming out and we get an idea of scale that way. On top here, so we have this drawn to scale, is the Earth and the Moon. So at least that gives you an idea about how far the Moon is away from the Earth. This other image down here is trying to get at how large the solar system is. Earth is already a very big thing. In any sort of normal conversation or normal thought process, the Earth is incredibly large. But it turns out if you put those to scale next to some of the other planets in the solar system, it's pretty small. Put that also again next to the sun, really small too. So in this image here, we're getting an idea of the scale of the solar system by thinking about uh, shrinking down the solar system to the size of a football field, right? It's 100 yards across. So from the sun to the outermost planet, Neptune, that is 100 yards. So what happens if we shrink down the scale to that size? Well, it turns out that the sun then is roughly the size of a golf ball, maybe even half the size of a golf ball, pretty small. That on the size of a football field. And it turns out that the Earth in that picture would be less than half the size of a dot that you would put on a piece of paper, right? Take a pen, put a dot, very, very tiny. And then also shown here are sort of where the orbits are for each of the planets, right? You can see Mars, Venus, Earth, and Mercury are all actually quite close to the sun, relatively speaking. And then there's a bit of a gap after Mars to Jupiter, and another sort of gap to Saturn, and then an even larger gap to Uranus, and again, another gap to Neptune. So I'm just gonna put on this Cosmic Voyage video, at least the first half of it. I'm gonna suggest you watch the second half of it on your own. There's also this Powers of 10 video, which is very good too. It's a very similar idea. It was just made um, several decades ago now. The Cosmic Voyage one is sort of more updated version.
Like I said, the powers of 10 is also another excellent version of that kind of video. One thing that maybe kind of gets lost in the Cosmic Voyage one is as they're stepping back, as you're zooming out, hopefully it's understood that you're not moving at a constant rate, right? We're not just flying away at the same speed because each one of those rings was another 10 times the size of the last one. And so what that means is essentially every ring that we moved out, we were traveling 10 times faster. If you were to keep watching that video, it goes sort of backwards. It starts zooming in, looking at the world of the very, very small. As it turns out, understanding that world, the atomic world, or the quantum world, is essential in order to do astronomy, at least what we're doing today, or what we do today. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in, I think, maybe the next lecture. But for now, just to think about the scale on that side, right, of zooming in, think about the size of an atom, like the thing that makes up the matter, makes, makes us up, is if you were to say compare the size of a penny to the moon, then the atom is in the same proportion to the penny as the penny is to the moon. Right, the penny is this tiny little thing compared to the moon, but in the same proportion almost, an atom is to the size of the penny. Extremely tiny little thing. And sort of like we do with the solar system, to get an idea of the scale within the atom, it turns out that the nucleus of the atom is incredibly small compared to the whole atom overall. Most of the size of the atom is just the kind of the orbit of the electron. But if you were to take, say, an atom and blow it up to the size of a football field again, 100 yards, then the nucleus of the atom is about the size of a dot of a pen. It's a tiny little thing compared to the whole size of the atom. It's similar in a way to like thinking about the scale of the solar system to the size of the sun, right? But it's actually even more extreme than that. So remember when we shrunk down the solar system to this football field size, the sun was still about the size of a golf ball. However, when we scale the same thing for the atom, the nucleus is a pretty tiny little thing. We'll talk a little bit more about atoms. Like we're not gonna get too much into elements and the composition of atoms, but hopefully you know that there are elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, carbon, oxygen, right? all these things, they are part of the periodic table, they are the basis of chemistry, and you know form all the different stuff that we interact with day to day. If you think about the composition of the cosmos overall though, it turns out that the universe is almost entirely, at least number-wise, made up of hydrogen and helium. If you then look at, say, something like a star, like the sun, our sun, then it's actually on more than 90% of it is hydrogen, and 8% helium, and then about 1% of some other things. Compare that to the composition of Earth, right, or a planet like Earth, and probably have something similar to this, where overall the Earth's composition is, there's a lot of iron, oxygen, silicon, magnesium, and so forth, some of these other ones. If you think about just the crust, Right, like the, the rocky stuff that's wrapped around, kind of thin layer wrapped around the Earth, that's the composition of that. Mostly oxygen, silicon, aluminum. And finally, if you think about the atmosphere, the air all around us, mostly made up of nitrogen and oxygen. So sort of to point this out that astronomy, we're lo mostly looking at things outside the Earth, right? And the Earth is a planet, and its makeup is fairly different from the universe overall. So last thing, um, in thinking about the universe very broadly, we're trying to understand like the scale of things overall, this idea of thinking of the entire history of the universe as shrunk down to one year of time is a way of thinking about the scale of time in the universe, right? How long it's been around, how long we've been around relative to the universe. If you do imagine shrinking the universe down to one year, right, that at the very beginning, 12 o'clock sharp a.m. January 1st, that's when the start of the universe is. It's actually a few months later then that our galaxy starts to form, and then you know, a few months after that until our solar system starts to form. So we're already into September of this year, and the solar system is forming, and it looks like in that month as well, life starts to begin on Earth, very simple life probably. In October, our atmosphere becomes oxygenated, and in November is when we start to first get complex life forms.
forms, like I think probably mean like multicellular life forms. So then we just look at the very last month of this year of the universe. So looking at December of that year, it's not until December 19th that vertebrates start to appear, right? That's things with the vertebrae, the backbones. It's not until the 25th that dinosaurs appeared, and the next day, 26th, that mammals appeared. And finally, it's not even until the last day, and actually in like the last minute or a few seconds of the very last day of this universe in a year, that humans appeared. All that is to say that the universe is very, very old, and we've been around for not a very long time, in comparison. So more back to astronomy. Just briefly to say that in astronomy, there's a number of different ways of thinking about the eras of astronomy, like ancient astronomy and modern astronomy. One way of thinking about it is in terms of sort of before and after Galileo. I don't need to get into too many details, but Galileo sort of got astronomy going in the modern way that we do it today, where you're sort of using instruments to actually make observations of the cosmos. But before Galileo, uh, people had been doing astronomy for, like I said, pretty much for as long as they've been around. And these are just a couple of examples of places and things that show astronomy being, being done for quite a long time in all kinds of places. You probably heard that a bit before Galileo, the dominated theory, at least in Europe and in sort of the Western world at the time, was that the universe was centered around Earth. I'm sure there were people that thought differently, but Copernicus is the first sort of recognized one as putting forth a theory where the sun is actually the center of the universe, or sort of our celestial sphere in a way, and we're orbiting around the sun, rather than the Earth being the center and the sun and all the other planets orbiting around. It's called the heliocentric theory. So after Copernicus, Galileo kind of took on that theory and used this new technology that had been come up with, the telescope, to study the movements of the stars and the planets and give a very strong observational footing for Copernicus's theory of the heliocentric solar system. And also around the time of Galileo, there was this guy named Bray, and he was doing a lot of very careful observations of the sky, and he made you know, tons of observations, writing down positions of stars and planets, um, that sort of stuff. And it turns out one of his pupils, this guy named Kepler, ended up taking those observations and all that data and formulating some of the first sort of laws of astronomy. So let's talk a little bit more about Kepler. So again, we can only go so far without mathematics, but conceptually, we try to think about these things called Kepler's laws, right? These are sort of rules that he came up with in order to describe the way that the planets seem to move. For one, he said the orbits were elliptical, right? The shape was actually an ellipse. This is a departure because the accepted theory at that time was that the orbits were circular, right? Perfect circles. So there's a whole idea of the heavens being these perfect places. Circles are perfect things, so they must be circles. Turns out, no, they're actually ellipses. A lot of the planets, their ellipses are pretty close to being circles, but they are, they're elliptical. So quickly, just one or two things we will need to know about it. an ellipse is an ellipse is this thing sort of defined by these two points, the focuses or the foci of the ellipse, instead of just the center of a circle. So if you take a circle and you sort of pull the center apart, then the, that circle squishes out a little bit and it becomes an ellipse, right? So those two points are sort of defined in the ellipse line. So there's also still the center of that ellipse. And if you cut the ellipse in half as long as it can go, right, that's what we call the major axis. And half of that, or from the center to the furthest point out on the ellipse, is the semi-major axis, right, that is A. Oh, and it turns out the sun sits at one of the foci of the ellipse, the orbit um, of these planets, of all the planets, right? But the second law, Kepler saw that the orbits actually sweep out equal areas in equal times. And that's what this picture is about. So if we look at the orbit of some planet, say from this point one to the point two, right? It takes a certain amount of time to go from one to two for that planet to go from one to two. And that sweeps out this area, this sort of like slice of pie or slice of pizza right there. 
So the amount of time that it takes to sweep out that area is going to be the same amount of time it takes to sweep out an equal area on the other side. So if we look over there, going from three to four, it sweeps out this area A, right? It's a much thinner slice, but it's much longer. And it turns out A and B are equal areas. So the time that it takes to go to one to two is the same amount of time it takes to go from three to four. Which also means that when the planet is orbiting closer to the sun, it's got to go faster, right? It's got to go this whole distance in the same amount of time that it goes that little distance. So it's faster here, slower out there. Kepler's third law then was that the square of the period of the ellipse is equal to the cube of the area of its orbit, right? Or the area of that ellipse. So you can write that mathematically. So the period squared is equal to the area cubed. And the period is just the amount of time that it takes to make one full revolution around the sun. The period for Earth, we could say, is about 365 days. Um, you could also just say it's one year and compare the other planets as how many Earth years that period is. It's actually a very typical thing. So we can also look at that and say, okay, the period, or the time that it takes to go around, is proportional to the area of that ellipse. Or another way of saying that is that the amount of time it takes to go around the sun for any orbit is proportional to how far away that planet is, right? or how large that orbit is. There's a larger area, this planet is further away. So just a little bit more about ellipses. I said that to make an ellipse, you sort of take a circle and then you spread that center point out into two of these things, these two foci of the ellipse. The amount that you spread it out kind of determines like how squashed that ellipse gets, right? So it becomes more of like this oval, further and further you pull them out. There's a word we use to describe how squished that ellipse is, and that's called eccentricity. So on the bottom here, there's a couple examples of ellipses and different eccentricities. So zero is the smallest eccentricity you can have, and that's just a circle, right? That's not squished at all. Uh, you go to 0.5, right, so it's like that, 0.75, 0.95. It turns out that once you get to one, it's actually no longer a closed shape anymore. It's a parabola. You don't need to worry too much about that, though. In terms of some of the planets and Pluto, these are the eccentricities of their orbits. The Earth, 0 0.017, right? So it's even quite a lot less than this 0 0.5 picture right down here. And you can see the orbits here, kind of a lot of stuff going on there, but the black lines are the orbits of the planets, and they look pretty close to circles, right? The fact that these eccentricities are like 0 0.0 something, 0 0.00 something, is saying they're very close to being circular. Probably one reason why it took so long to realize that they weren't circles they're just really close to being circles. Except for, say, Pluto, 0.25. Still fairly close to being a circle, but it's quite a lot more elliptical than the planet's orbits are. Kepler came up with these very useful laws, and, but they're sort of like describing the orbits. There wasn't all that much in the way of understanding what was causing the orbits to be like this, why they were like that. So not too long after Kepler, comes Newton. Can't really get around talking about Newton if you're talking about anything in terms of physics and astronomy. It's a very big figure. And he did a number of different things. One of them was to formulate what are known as Newton's laws of motion. Being laws of motion, they're all about describing how things move and act when stuff happens to them or when nothing happens to them. So let's just look at the laws here, right? The first one says that every object will continue to be in a state of rest or move at a constant speed in a straight line unless it is compelled to change. So if an object is just sitting there, it's going to want to keep sitting there. If an object is zooming along at a constant speed, it's going to want to keep zooming along at a constant speed. So something has to come along to change that motion. It doesn't just change spontaneously. The second law is how does that motion change? Well, the change in the motion of a body is proportional to and in the direction of the force acting on it. So a uh, force is just sort of like a push or a pull that you act on some object or that gets acted on an object. You can think about that as like you pushing on something. It turns out these laws of motion work for things that um, have forces that are not directly in contact, right? So that being, you know, like 
electrical charges, magnets, right? They act at a distance, but they follow the same rule. And then finally, the last one says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Or for every force that gets applied, there is another force coming back. It's like action, reaction. If I push on this wall, the wall is actually pushing with the same amount of force back on me. If it wasn't, then the wall would move, I'd do this. or I'd go through the wall. So Newton's laws of motion refer to what we call massive objects. That means these are objects that are made up of matter, like protons, electrons, atoms, molecules, the stuff we're made up of, stuff we deal with in our day-to-day -day life. So how massive an object is, we measure by something we call mass. How much mass does an object have? And when we're talking about like stars and galaxies, right, we're interested in how much mass makes something up, um, but there's also how large the thing is, and you put those two quantities together, we can talk about how tightly packed things are. So these are quantities we call mass, volume, and density. In short, mass is how much stuff there is, the volume is how big is that stuff, and the density is how tightly packed all that stuff is. Yeah. A little bit more detail there, mass is just measure the amount of material within an object, and a little bit about the units that we typically use to measure the mass, right? kilograms, grams, pounds. Though pounds is actually a, kind of a tricky one because there's multiple definitions of pounds. But in the metric system, we use kilograms and grams and so forth. Then we talk about how much space an object takes up and measure that usually in cubic units. So how many cubic centimeters or cubic meters or cubic yards, cubic feet. A liter is also actually a unit of volume. One liter is a thousand cubic centimeters. So you think about how much volume a cubic centimeter is, well, it's a cube that is one centimeter on each side. A centimeter is maybe like around the width of your uh, pinky nail. So imagine a cube that's that wide, that deep, and that high, right? the cubic centimeter. Density, again, combines mass and volume. It is exactly the amount of mass per the volume that this object takes up. And just some examples of the density of different materials. Um, it turns out that we sort of define pure liquid water as kind of a standard, one gram per cubic centimeter. So other ones here, gold is almost 20 times as dense as water, 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Lead is quite dense typical sort of rock. Wood is less dense, why wood floats in water. Uh, foam, like styrofoam, even less dense. So those are sort of typical materials you might deal with. Also threw in some of the ones that the book points out here are these sort of non-typical uh, materials, like a uh, comet's tail. Density of material in a comet's tail is extremely low, right? 10 to the minus six grams per cubic centimeter, or 0.00000, .00000 one grams per cubic centimeter. And on the other end, uh, we'll eventually talk about neutron stars, but these are stars that have sort of collapsed like late in their life and all the material is really co condensed down and you get this unimaginably dense material, which is something like 10 to the 15th grams per cubic centimeter. So a couple other properties and things we're gonna need as we go along in this course are velocity, inertia, and momentum. So velocity, you're probably fairly familiar with. Velocity is essentially the speed of an object and the direction that object moves. Some examples of velocity, 60 miles per hour north, right? 60 miles per hour is a speed. If I add in which direction it's going, now it's a velocity. 25 meters per second upwards, 12 miles per second towards the constellation Cygnus. I actually threw that one in because that is roughly the speed that our solar system is traveling through the galaxy. These other concepts, inertia and momentum, can be tricky things to deal with, but it turns out that Newton's three laws of motion can really be understood as explaining these properties of inertia and momentum and the fact that an object's momentum is generally conserved, or it stays the same unless something happens to it. So as far as inertia, inertia is just a property that says like how difficult it is to get an object moving or to slow an object down. And it's a property that all massive objects have, all things that are made up of 
protons, electrons, atoms, and it is proportional to the mass of an object. Right? So the mass is sort of a measure of the inertia of an object. So a more massive object, you probably know, is harder to move. Right? We're harder to get moving, harder to slow down, harder to speed up. So inertia is something that's proportional to mass. Um, this other property called momentum is something that massive objects have whenever they're in motion, whenever they're moving. So if something's moving, we say it has momentum. And if you want to change the momentum of an object, right, you want to change its motion, then you need to apply some force. Some force needs to be applied. And it turns out that the momentum of an object is proportional to its mass and its velocity. That being said, to change an object's momentum, you can also change its mass. But most of the stuff we're thinking about, the mass is generally all staying the same, like you're not throwing material away. So when we think about changing the momentum of an object, we're generally thinking about forces need to be applied. Right? Some kind of push or some kind of pull needs to happen. So one other property that sort of comes out of Newton's three laws, or is very much related to Newton's three laws, is also a kind of momentum, but it's a momentum that is associated with uh, rotation, with things spinning or turning about. So we call this kind of momentum angular momentum, angular meaning like rotating through angles, and it can be quite a complicated thing, difficult concept. Really, the only thing we're going to be using from this idea of angular momentum is the fact that if something's spinning and it sort of collapses or it shrinks, the rate that it's spinning is going to increase. And we can see that with this ice skater. You know, she's spinning around and she starts to collapse her mass in. She brings her arms in and she spins faster and faster. This also relates to what I told you earlier. If you have orbits that are around the sun, right, you imagine an orbit that's very far out. If you bring that orbit in and you collapse it a bit, then it's going to spin faster, right? The rate is uh, generally going to increase. And you can see that in this diagram of the motion of the planets, or at least the inner planets, right? Mercury is spinning around quite fast, Venus pretty fast, Earth and the Moon a bit, a bit slower, Mars even slower. Okay. So Newton's laws of motion talk about forces between objects, right? And like I said, it's easy to think about me applying a force by just like imagining pushing on something. But he's trying to understand the motion of things they weren't really obvious that there was a force acting on them. So something like an apple falling from a tree, or the moon orbiting around the Earth. So take the apple, right? If I hold an apple in my hand, and all of a sudden move my hand away. If you think about it in terms of Newton's laws, that apple, for that instant, is at rest. Right? Well, it's at rest in my hand, yeah? And if I move my hand, it's at rest right then, and what we notice is that it starts to fall. Right? It starts to move towards the Earth. So Newton's first law then would say that there needs to be a force acting on that object, right? Otherwise, it's at rest and wants to stay at rest. So there needs to be a force that's pulling it towards the Earth. Newton then proposed a force that we can't see it happening, but it's always there between massive objects. Any objects that are made up of matter or massive, they're going to attract each other. And that attraction, he said, is proportional to the mass of each of the objects. The larger the mass of either of them, the larger that force is going to be. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Or you can just think about that as like, it gets less the further these objects are apart. So we call this attraction the force of gravity. Think about for a second then the motion of the moon around the Earth. If you recall, I said that the velocity of an object is its speed along with its direction. So you think about the moon moving around the Earth, right? At one second, it's going that way. Another second later, it's going that way. A little bit later, it's going that way. So it's actually continuously changing the direction that it's going, right? Meaning its velocity is changing, which also means, since the momentum is proportional to that velocity, the momentum of the moon is constantly changing. So this was another thing that Newton was thinking about. If his laws of motion are correct, then the moon should want to keep going in the direction it's going unless there's a force acting on it. Well, that's where this force of gravity comes in again. Right? So if you think about the moon, say, moving along in this direction, the Earth is down here, right? that force of gravity is between these two massive objects, the moon and the Earth. 
So it goes from the moon and points towards the Earth. And what ends up happening, if something is moving along in one direction and you push perpendicular to that motion, you end up turning that object. So the moon coming along, push down a little bit here, it starts to turn and turn and turn. And it's constantly pointing towards the Earth, so it's constantly turning sort of around the Earth. This is one of the reasons that Newton is so widely regarded. For a long time, people had sort of looked at the stars and the planets and the sort of celestial sphere and tried to think about their motion, what, what's going on up there. But that was sort of disconnected for at least like Western thought from what was going on on Earth. So it was really Newton who sort of saw that those two things are actually described by the same idea, right? This force that attracts massive objects together. And one of the outcomes of his laws and his way of describing that motion was actually a modification of Kepler's third law. You remember Kepler's third law was about the area and the period of the orbit of, say, like the Earth or some planet around the Sun. So for Kepler, it was just the cube of the area was equal to the square of the period. Newton, using his new idea, actually found that there's another term in there, which is the sum or the combination of the masses of the two objects. As it turns out, when you write out this equation with, say, like the Earth and the Sun, and you use the mass of the sun as like a standard in your relationship, so say the mass of the sun is one, then the mass of the earth ends up being like 0, 0.00 something. It's really, really small compared to the sun. So that's why in that equation, this modification of Kepler's law, that mass one plus mass two, for all of like Kepler's observations, the planets and the sun, it ended up being about one anyway, right? So that's why you never really noticed that there was actually something different. It's a pretty powerful tool to use in astronomy though, right? If you are looking at something, the orbit of something, and you can measure how large that orbit is, the area of it, you can measure how long that orbit takes, how long it goes around to go around once, then that will tell you something about the masses that are involved in that system, right? You look at another star system, another solar system. So thinking about orbits still, right? What does it take for an object to orbit something? Right? If you think about the Earth orbiting the Sun, or you think about a satellite or the Moon orbiting the Earth. So, like I said a minute ago, the Moon is constantly being turned by the force of gravity from the Earth. Right? Constantly turning. But it turns out it's moving fast enough along that it is sort of always turning around the Earth. So it's getting pulled down to the Earth, but not getting pulled down fast enough that it's ever going to crash into the Earth. It's just getting turned around and does this orbit thing around the Earth. So Newton had this idea of thinking about, okay, what would it take, or what would sort of happen if I imagine uh, throwing an object or shooting an object horizontally along the Earth's surface faster and faster and faster. I think this is actually a drawing on the right side from one of his uh, publications. These days this is called Newton's cannon, and you're sort of imagining firing a cannonball faster and faster and faster, and what happens, right? Well, you fire the cannonball at, at one speed, it goes a little bit, but you know, it's getting pulled down by gravity, so it falls towards the Earth and lands on the Earth. You shoot it faster, it can go further, but it's still falling towards the Earth, so it falls and falls and falls, eventually lands on the Earth still. You go fast enough, then it's falling, but it's going far enough as it falls that it's actually sort of matching the curvature of the Earth. So it's say it falls down this distance, but the Earth's surface is also falling down that distance, right? Or is actually curved down that distance too. If you imagine then throwing an object faster and faster and faster and faster, eventually you get to the speed where it's falling, but it never actually hits the Earth. It falls around the Earth, and it's just going to keep going, and that's an orbit. It turns out that the minimum speed to do that is about eight kilometers per second. That'll get you to a circular orbit. Um, if you go faster than that, then you get into an elliptical orbit. And if you can get an object up to 11 kilometers per second, that's what we call the escape speed. That's enough of that sort of movement that it's going to get away from Earth's gravitational field entirely. It's a nice little animation showing this thought experiment in motion. That's about it. Just wanted to point out a couple other things in this lecture before we move on. One is just thinking about some of the other stuff in the solar system, and we'll get back to things like asteroids and comets a bit later on, but uh, as it turns out, 
in between Mars and Jupiter, like I pointed out a while ago, there's a bit of a gap, and in that gap there's an asteroid belt, debris, rocks, and such that orbit around the sun about that distance. Um, then even further out, past the last planet Neptune, we get another asteroid belt called the Kuiper Belt. I think that's how you pronounce that. And then even further out, it's theorized that there's these sort of asteroid belt-like things, but more like diffuse and maybe made up of uh, ice and such like that, called the Oort Cloud. And the last thing to point out is just a little bit of terminology and maybe information of interest is that the planets are orbiting the sun and they're all orbiting in basically the same plane, right? So the Earth goes around like this. Mars also is a bit bigger, but it goes around the same plane. That plane we call the ecliptic, which is just defined by the shape that the Earth draws around the sun, right? So that plane that the Earth rotates around, we call the ecliptic. And we'll come back to this idea in the formation of the solar system and the fact that it formed on a sort of swirling disk, and so we end up with most of the planets in this uh, nice point. And that's it. We made it to the end of the first lecture. Congratulations. More fun stuff to come. I will see you next time.